Hi everyone, it's Dr. A, and in this video, we'll be discussing the bones and joints that form both the foot and ankle. Now, right before we get there, let's take a moment to talk about the makeup of this particular area. First, it's helpful to note that we have a total of 26 bones that make up the foot, and these bones collectively form an arch that is typically visible from a medial view, which we'll talk about more in just a moment. And it's our collection of these 26 bones in the foot that connect with the rest of the body because of its articulation with the tibia and fibula. So let's take just a moment to identify these bones and their positioning within the foot. Now, as we start examining the foot, let's do so from a superior perspective. And one of the first things we should do is identify which of the two feet is being examined. And as it's shown here, we're looking at the right foot. And we know this is the right foot considering the orientation of the great toe, which is along the midline of the body. So now that we've got our orientation situated, let's start labeling what we refer to as the rear foot and work our way anteriorly to identify the components of the midfoot and forefoot. In the rear foot, we have the calcaneus, or what we commonly refer to as the heel, and next we have the talus, and what we also refer to as the trochlear part of the talus. And we should make a note regarding the trochlear part of the talus. It's because of this design that makes movements like dorsiflexion and plantar flexion possible. Now, moving up to the midfoot, we have a group of bones called the cuneiforms. And within this group, we have the medial, intermediate, and lateral cuneiforms. In addition, we have the navicular and the cuboid. Now, one of the things that's helpful in our orientation is to remember that the navicular is on the medial aspect of the foot and the cuboid is on the lateral aspect of the foot. Next, it's also helpful to remember that the names of the cuneiforms follow their positioning. For example, we start with the medial cuneiform, which is on the medial aspect of the foot, followed by the intermediate cuneiform, because it's in the middle, and then our lateral cuneiform, because it's on the lateral aspect of the foot. Moving to the forefoot, we have our metatarsals, and our metatarsals are numbered 1 through 5, beginning with the medial aspect. So we have metatarsals 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Now, starting with the great toe, we have what's called the proximal phalanx. And following this, we have the distal phalanx. Now, let's clear the board for just a moment so that you can see how things change some when we move on to toes 2 through 5 because here we have proximal, middle, and distal phalanxes. Now let's look at the undersurface of the foot. It's here that we'll of course find the same structures we identified earlier. And in doing so, it gives us a fuller picture of the size and nuances of those same bones, even allowing us to see some unique features that we wouldn't be able to see from an anterior view. So let's start in the same manner we did earlier by identifying the components of the rear foot. First, we have the calcaneus. And if we look towards the midline of the body, we'll see a portion of the trochlear surface of the talus. Now, moving up to the midfoot and starting medially, we have the navicular. And moving laterally from this position, we'll find the cuboid. And next, we'll see the lateral, intermediate, and medial cuneiform. Now, we can give our attention again to the metatarsals, and specifically what we can see with greater clarity are the metatarsal heads, or what we may easily identify as rounded projections. And if you'll notice, the first metatarsal has two small bones on its undersurface, and we refer to these as sesamoid bones. And extending from these metatarsals, we'll find the phalanges. 
The first joint we'll take a look at is the tibiofibular joint, which is the articulation between the tibia and fibula, which is joined together at both the proximal and distal ends, making them the proximal and distal tibiofibular joints. Now, upon further inspection, we'll also see that these joints are joined together by an interosseous membrane, shown here in pink, that provide added support. And one point of note here is that it's at the distal tibiofibular joint that serves as the location in which high ankle sprains occur. Now, let's classify these joints, and we'd say that they are syndesmosis joints. Next up, let's take a look at what we should refer to as the true ankle joint. And the name of this joint is the talocrural joint. And for notation purposes, let's make a note that it's this joint that is made up of the articulations between the talus, the distal tibia, and the distal fibula. And it's here at this joint that we also have the production of movements such as dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. And in terms of the motion available during these movements, we are provided with approximately 15 to 20 degrees of dorsiflexion and 50 degrees of plantar flexion. And lastly, let's classify this joint, which is a ganglimus joint. The next joint that we'll take a look at here is the subtalar joint and the transverse tarsal joints. Specifically, it's the subtalar joint that is made up of the articulation between the talus and the calcaneus. And it's by the name of this joint alone that indicates we're looking at a joint that is underneath, hence the word sub, and then tailor referring to the talus. So a joint that is underneath the talus. Next is the transverse tarsal joint, which is the combination of two joints, and it's also known as or is referred to as Chopart's joint. And it represents the articulation between the talus and navicular, shown here by the green highlight, and the calcaneus and the cuboid, shown here by the purple highlight. And it's here at the transverse tarsal, or Chopart's joint, that we have the movements of inversion and eversion taking place. And in terms of the degrees of motion in these movements, we have approximately 20 to 30 degrees of inversion available, and 5 to 15 degrees of eversion available. Now, to classify these joints, we'd say that they are arthroidal joints. Next, we have the metatarsophalangeal joints, which represent the articulation between the phalanges and the metatarsals, and they are classified as condyloid joints. And specifically at the great toe, we'll find the widest variability in motion. Here, it's common to see flexion at 45 degrees and extension at 70 degrees. And at the metatarsophalangeal joints of the lesser toes, it's typical to see 40 degrees of flexion and 40 degrees of extension occur. In addition, we do have minimal abduction and adduction that occur as well. Next, let's talk about the interphalangeal joint of the great toe, which is a ganglimus joint. It can typically maintain 0 degrees of extension and achieve up to 90 degrees of flexion. Now, for the four lesser toes, let's take a look at the proximal interphalangeal joints, which are also ganglimus type joints. It's here that these joints can typically maintain 0 degrees of extension it can achieve up to 35 degrees of flexion. Now, moving to the distal interphalangeal joint, which is also a ganglimus type of joint, it's typical to achieve 30 degrees of extension and 60 degrees of flexion. However, we want to highlight the fact that in this joint and many others, there is a great deal of variability in the amount of motion one can achieve. 
One of the next things we'll want to shift our attention to is the ligamentous structures that support our bones. And while there are a number of ligaments in the foot and ankle, we'll give our attention to a few. Let's start by looking at ligaments on the lateral aspect of the foot and ankle. It's these ligaments in particular that are likely to be injured if an individual sustained an inversion ankle sprain. The first of these ligaments is the anterior talofibular ligament, followed by the calcaneofibular ligament, and the posterior talofibular ligament. Now, to help us remember the name of these ligaments, we simply need to know or recall the bony structures of the foot and ankle because these ligaments simply inform us of the direction and the name of the bones it connects to. Next up, let's take a look at the medial view of the ankle. It's here where we'll place our attention on the deltoid ligaments. And it's this collection of ligaments that are likely to become injured if an individual sustains an eversion ankle sprain, which in general are far less common than inversion ankle sprains. Now, one of the things we should note here is that although we may typically think about the term deltoid being associated with the number three, we have four ligaments in this case. These ligaments include the anterior tibiotalar ligament, the tibionavicular ligament, the tibiocalcaneal ligament, and the posterior tibiotalar ligament. And just as was mentioned earlier, the names of these ligaments indicate their location and the bony structures they attach to. Now, let's turn our attention to the arches of the foot, which are formed by the unique combination of our 26 bones along with our ligaments that support them. In total, we have three arches, and of these three, two are referred to as longitudinal arches. The first arch we'll take a look at is the medial longitudinal arch, which is on the medial aspect of the foot, and it extends from the calcaneus to the talus to the navicular, the three cuneiforms, and the end of the three metatarsals. And we can also note here that this particular arch is stabilized or supported by the tibialis posterior and tibialis anterior muscles. Next, we have the lateral longitudinal arch, which by the name informs us that this arch is on the lateral aspect of the foot. And this particular arch extends from the calcaneus to the cuboid and to the ends of the fourth and fifth metatarsals. And lastly, we have the transverse arch, and it's this arch that extends from the first metatarsal to the fifth metatarsal. And this arch is further supported by the complex network of muscles within the foot, which you'll oftentimes hear referred to as the intrinsic musculature of the foot. An additional structure that we should give our attention to is the plantar fascia. And with this term, let's first make note of the fact that the term plantar refers to the undersurface of the foot, and on the undersurface of the foot, we have a fascia. And a fascia is a sheet or band of fibrous connective tissue. And it's this plantar fascia that extends from the calcaneus to the proximal phalanxes of the toes, and its function is in stabilizing the medial longitudinal arch in propelling the body forward in the latter part of the stance phase. So collectively, here are the movements of the foot and ankle. Specific to the talocrural joint, we have the movements of plantar flexion and dorsiflexion, which occur in the sagittal plane. And for the subtalar joint, we have both inversion and eversion, which are rotational movements, and they occur in the transverse plane. Well, thank you for watching this video. I hope it's been helpful. 
And if you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below. And I'll look forward to connecting with you again in the next video.